Hello, and welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, November 15th, 2022, we discuss Humphrey's executor and presidential removal power. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of the practice groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call, as the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. In the interest of time, our introductions will be brief, but if you'd like to know more about any of our speakers, you can access their full bios on fedsoc.org. I'll introduce our moderator and I'll leave it to him to introduce the rest of our panel. Today, we are fortunate to have with us as our moderator, Professor Aram Gavor, who is an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professorial Lecturer at the, of Law at George Washington University Law School. He is a nationally recognized scholar and author in the fields of administrative law, federal courts, and national security law, and has been published in law journals, including the Florida Law Review, Indiana Law Journal, Ohio State Law Journal, and Administrative Law Review. Throughout this panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature so our speakers will have access to them when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you all for being with us today. Professor Gavur, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kayla, and thank you to the Federalist Society for sponsoring uh, this event. Uh, this particular teleforum is brought to you by the Federalist Society's Administrative Law and Practice Group. So today you'll learn about how a little known 1935 Supreme Court separation of powers case, Humphrey's executor versus the United States, is coming up a lot at high levels in litigations throughout the country. Uh, for example, last Monday uh, in Axon Enterprises versus the Federal Trade Commission, uh, uh, Humphreys came up uh, in, in the cert petition, but also argued uh, by Paul Clement in oral argument. Uh, on that same day in Securities and Exchange Commission versus Cochrane, uh, which was also argued last Monday, uh, Humphreys did not arise in oral argument, but the Solicitor General discussed that case with uh, with great significance in the cert petition uh, that the government filed. So the, the case backdrop for today uh, is Federal Trade Commission versus Walmart, uh, a case that the Federal Trade Commission initiated on June 28th of this year in the Northern District of Illinois over the objection of two of its commissioners and a declination by the U.S. Department of Justice to initiate enforcement. Uh, that case alleged that Walmart unlawfully allowed its money transfer services to be used by fraudsters in violation of the agency's telemarketing sales rule, otherwise known as TSR, if, uh, if you're looking at the briefing. Uh, and um, that is a rule that it enacted under the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Act, otherwise known as the Telemarketing Act, and other uh, FTC authorities. So in late August, Walmart filed a motion to dismiss the suit, arguing that it should not be held liable for criminal actions of unrelated third-party fraudsters. The primary argument, though, that Walmart brought uh, in favor of dismissal um, was that the Federal Trade Commission lacks constitutionally valid authority to initiate litigation seeking monetary damages or injunctive relief. Now, the fulcrum jurisprudence of this argument uh, really rests on Humphrey's executor in which the court held that the Federal Trade Commissioner can act independently of the president upholding a statute uh, that allowed for only for cause removal, as opposed to at will removal by the president. And consequently, the FTC's commissioner's independence uh, from the president also comes, as Walmart and many others argue, with a cost, that it cannot exercise certain Article II powers, uh, which includes seeking monetary damages and injunctive relief. So constitutionally speaking, what are we talking about? Uh, this is the Appointments Clause of the Constitution, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, which established procedures for the president uh, for the appointment of officers of the United States. The text in relevant parts states the president, quote, shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other key text, officers of the United States. But unlike the power to appoint officers of the United States, the Constitution is silent with regard to the power to remove officers at will, uh, which the Supreme Court and the president um, have construed as uh, necessary incidental authorities uh, for the ability of the president to oversee the executive branch, as is his charge under Article 2. Now, there's a lot more to it, but let's leave that for the discussants uh, to engage in. So with us, we have a really fantastic panel um, that have assembled today. Uh, very grateful to be part of this group. 
Professor Greg Dolan, who's a senior litigation counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance and also a professor uh, at the University of Baltimore Law School. Uh, Dan Z. Epstein, who's director at Trust Ventures. Roger Severino, who's the vice president for domestic policy and the Joseph C. and Elizabeth A. Anderlich Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, Professor Kimberly Whaley, uh, professor of law at the University of Baltimore Law School and also a visiting professor at the Washington College of Law. Let me just tell you a little bit more about their backgrounds, uh, and then I will uh, we'll have a period of time where each of them will speak uh, in alphabetical order. We'll have some moderated discussion, and then we'll get to questions from the audience. Uh, so as I mentioned, Greg's a professor at the University of Baltimore Law School. His scholarship focuses on the intersection of patent, administrative, and constitutional law. So uh, in addition to a number of articles, he's also authored a number of amicus briefs, uh, one of which he uh, endeavored to file in the FTC versus Walmart case that was rejected by the court um, in, in, I think, an observation of the FTC's opposition. Uh, he also received, uh, in terms of his, his educational background, his bachelor's degree with honors from Johns Hopkins and a Juris Doctor from Georgetown University. He also holds an MD with Recognition in Humanities from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and a master's degree in philosophy. So he's um, he's pretty well educated. Uh, and, and prior to coming uh, uh, to a secondary role that he has at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, where he's a senior counsel, he also spent two years as an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Palau. Uh, Remarkable. Dan Epstein, our second discussant, uh, is a lawyer and political economist who runs regulatory and legal diligence and operations uh, for, near, for nearly four, 40 portfolio companies uh, for a venture capital law firm. Uh, so I've, I've known Dan for years uh, and um, the type of work he does at, uh, at Trust Ventures is, is typical of his body of work. So for example, He's helped the general wellness. Uh, he's, he's helped the general wellness device, telemedicine, and dietary supplement op entrepreneurs evade uh, um, and, and comply with FDA strictures, evading enforcement. Uh, prior to this role, he was at the White House Counsel's Office, uh, where he worked on a number of important uh, issues, including two executive actions signed by President Trump. Um, he was the founder uh, of the Cause of Action Institute and was its executive director, where he developed clients and cases behind uh, the following bet the company regulatory challenges in Ray LabMD uh, involving FTC's failed attempt to prosecute a cancer lab under its Section 5 authority, Bucky Balls versus the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Rio Lanas versus the Department of Labor, Drake's Bay versus Salazar, Gethels versus Commerce, the list goes on and on. Um, He's also testified twice before Congress on regulatory oversight issues, uh, and he's written extensively on the relationship between administrative procedure and legislative oversight. Uh, he also worked on Capitol Hill, uh, where he oversaw the investigation of exposed tax fraud by the nation's largest community organizer, uh, leading President Obama to sign legislation permanently blocking the organization from receiving federal funds. Now, if we ask him nicely, he might tell us about how he uh, needed to dive into dumpsters uh, to get that information. He's he's very rigorous. Uh, Roger Severino, our next discussant, he's the vice president of the Heritage Foundation where he oversees domestic policy and a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center where he works on the EPPC's uh, Health and Human Services Agency Accountability Project. Uh, so he's a national authority on civil rights, conscience and religious freedom, the administrat administrative state and information privacy. Uh, particularly as applied to the sector of healthcare law and policy. So before joining the EPPC and Heritage, he was the director of the Office of Civil Rights OCR at the US Department of Health and Human Services, where he led a team of over 250 staff enforcing the nation's civil rights conscious and religious freedom and health information privacy laws. Um, you should look up uh, the prior office holders of OCR. It's a, it's a pretty significant list of folks. Uh, so he's a graduate of USC, received a master's in public policy from Carnegie Mellon University, and he earned his, bat his law degree at Harvard Law. Uh, and, and last but certainly not least is uh, Kimberly Whaley, who's a visiting professor right now at American University's Washington College of Law and a tenured law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where she teaches civil procedure, administrative law, and federal courts. She's also a legal contributor. You've probably seen her on the news a whole bunch. 
uh, for ABC News and regularly writes for Politico, The Atlantic, The Bulwark, The Guardian, and The Hill. Her scholarship focuses on the separation of powers with particular emphasis on presidential power and administrative agencies. She's a former assistant United States attorney, associate independent counsel on the Whitewater investigation, and the author of a number of books. Uh, some I want to mention some of them. What You Need to Know About Voting and Why, How to Read the Constitution and Why, and How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why. Uh, she has a very active Twitter and Instagram account, uh, where she also hosts an IGTV series called Simple Politics. Uh, so thanks again for our discussions. I will give the floor to Greg uh, to talk for about six to eight minutes uh, about Humphreys. Thank you, Aram, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, the federal... Thank you, Federal Society, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be part of these uh, seminars and uh, teleforms. So, uh, as Aaron mentioned, one of my one of the hats that I wear is uh, a senior litigation counsel for uh, the New Civil Liberties Alliance. And as he also mentioned, we did try to put an amicus brief in FTC versus Walmart, which was rejected uh, by the court. In our defense, I'll say that this was not for any necessarily substantive deficiency in the brief. We were in a good company. The court also rejected a brief by a professor at George Mason University, and uh, as well as I believe by the Chamber of, of Commerce. Uh, so they basically rejected all amicus briefs on the theory that um, the court said, look, I'm just an inferior court. We're just doing facts here. If you want an amicus brief, wait until it gets on appeal or to the Supreme Court. So, but, since we wrote this brief, I might and uh, I might as well have somebody listen to it, if not the if not the trial judge. And so I'm going to try to kind of to recapitulate uh, what we said and kind of our critique of um, of Humphreys. And uh, the basic premise of Humphreys, as I understand it, uh, maybe Kim will put a different spin on it. Uh, but the basic premise of Humphreys, is, as I understand it, is that at least as, as it was decided when it was decided. It was this notion that this is a kind of quasi-legislative, potentially quasi-judicial agency. They don't really access executive power as such, and therefore uh, this is okay. But in uh, in our view, the conception, there, there's two separate reasons why Humphreys is wrong, and let me begin with the broader one. And the broader one is that the conception of the executive power uh, adopted by the Supreme Court all the way back in 1930s is just too cramped. It kind of it just used executive power as merely the power to execute the law. So, you know, Congress passes the law prohibiting, I don't know, cocaine, and the president, through his subordinates, goes around arresting people and putting them on trial for cocaine possession. But the power is actually broader. As we've explained in our brief, it actually includes not just the executive power, uh, not just the power to execute the laws, but kind of the whole force and vitality of the nation. So as uh, there's a quote that nations action, strength, and force. And one way to, to show that uh, the power includes more than mere execution of laws is you can just have to look at president's foreign power. Congress doesn't actually pass lots of laws about defining foreign power. Congress doesn't actually itself recognize it or derecognize its foreign governments. That's all done by the executive branch without, and so they're not necessarily executing any laws, they're exercising the nation's strength and the nation force in dealing with uh, our foreign counterparts. And so if that is true, of course the president, and everybody I think on this panel and pretty much everywhere else agrees, the president cannot act alone. He probably, in the in a country of 300 million people, probably couldn't act alone even at the time of George Washington. They have to have advisors, they have to have people carrying things out, they have to have the ambassadors who actually would be representatives of our country abroad, they have to have counselors, etc. So, but if it is, if the executive power, including the power, kind of the entirety of the nation's forces vested in the president, then it follows that the president should be able to remove people who undermine that force and undermine the nation's strength and vitality. Of course, we might all disagree as to what exactly makes our nations more or less vital, but that is why, after all, we have elections. And that is why when the new president comes in, he, if she or she, if she chooses to uh, change the direction of the nation, change the application of our strength, vitality, and force, should be able to remove all those officials who undermine that president's vision. And so on that broad view of what executive power is, and after all, the Constitution does say executive power, right? it doesn't say power to execute laws. 
So, and that I think is an important distinction. On that broad view of executive power, even the 1930s reading uh, of the FTC statute at the time, where the court says, well, it's not really executing any laws, it's just doing kind of reports for Congress and maybe some quasi judicial functions, is, in our view, wrong. Why? Because by having this effect on the nation's economy, the FTC does ultimately bring the force of the nation to bear on the uh, party's economic activity. But, you know, even if you don't buy that argument, there's a narrower argument against F the present day FTC. Because back in the 1930s, FTC actually did not have executive power to execute the laws, kind of the narrow view, view of executive power. It did not have a power to prosecute and bring cases in federal courts. That was added much later in the 1970s. And yet, no, I, I don't want to say no one, but and yet kind of it just FTC's ability to uh, proceed with this uh, new newly acquired power basically went almost kind of unnoticed on the strength of Humphrey's executor decided 40 years prior. But the problem is that the, the very nature of the FTC has changed. What the Supreme Court has blessed in 1930s is very different from what FTC is now. And FTC now exercises a real executive power. FTC has separate litigation authority. FTC uh, can bring, can hail people into court. FTC can actually oppose the Justice Department. A number of years ago, there was a case where, I think I believe under George W. Bush administration, where FTC and the DOJ Antitrust Division took a different view of whether or not certain settlements between patentees and generic drug manufacturers are appropriate. And they filed case, they filed briefs on different sides of an issue in the Supreme Court. And that seems to be just wrong. So even if you take the view that presidential executive power is just a power to execute laws, it cannot be that the president's Justice Department thinks the law should be executed in one way, and FTC should think it should be executed in another way, and the president cannot put basically a stop to that dispute. Aaron has told me that I have only about a minute left. So let me just close by this. I don't think there's going to be much dispute in saying, look, if Congress wants to create some sort of advisory body, body like, for example, Congressional Research Service, where you know you might even ask the president to appoint people merely to write reports, tell us how things work, tell us what is a good idea, what is a bad idea, tell us kind of how an economy does or does not work. That would be kind of this quasi- advisory quasi-legislative power. And that probably is fine. But once you give a agency ability to adjudicate, taking things away from federal courts, or ability to execute, whether in a broad or narrow sense, that creates a problem and that undermines the fundamental liberty protection of our Constitution, which is, as Justice Scalia said many times, all the worst countries, all the worst regimes had the best constitutions. And I know I grew up in one. The Soviet Union had an amazing constitution with all sorts of civil rights protections written in, and yet none of them were enforced. Why? Because liberty protection stems not so much from the Bill of Rights, which is, of course, important, but from the fact that three branches of government fight for their power, thus making sure not, no one of them becomes too powerful. And having these independent agencies that are both judge, jury, and, and executioner fundamentally undermines that, uh, that setup. I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Greg. Dan, you're up next. All right. I, uh, I'll i try to be quick. Um, and maybe the best way for me to kind of share my thoughts um, is almost in response to Greg. Um, you know, I, I uh, as kind of already mentioned, I'm kind of naturally an Article One guy. Um, and, you know, what I what I think is important, obviously, underlying kind of any discussion of Humphrey's executor, you know, when it comes to the question of can the president hire and fire, um, you get into the, the kind of load of the fun issues, which is, you know, is the FTC or the SEC a law enforcement agency, or is it simply uh, a kind of investigative commission? And I think, um, you know, I want to kind of start with um, some history um, that I think is responsive to some of the things Greg said. Uh, and maybe you can view this as a tepid defense of Humphreys. Um, the idea that um, the president is supposed to have this very big role over the economy um, is certainly uh, a notion that does not comport um, with, I think, 
the original understanding of the Constitution um, and certainly with history. Um, the first is, is that um, just look at what is the kind of law of the soil of you know, British America. Uh, it was uh, the Hudson's Bay Corporation Charter. Um, and uh, that uh, charter uh, was a corporate charter that very much throughout uh, uh, the history of this country, uh, corporate charters, corporations, um, which included kind of most city infrastructure, uh, most kind of um, uh, regulations done at the county level or the city level. Historically, these were all called corporations. Um, that is very much uh, something that our courts throughout the 19th century have viewed as kind of legislative in character. Um, and that, that is something that goes all the way back before we even had a constitution. So the idea that um, kind of it is the executive um, that is supposed to have a, a major role uh, when it comes to uh, regulating people's lives um, is, is just kind of historically not true. Uh, in fact, the Hudson's Bay Company is still alive today. Uh, many of you have been there. It's called Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, so, and then I think that relates to kind of the second historical point, which is when we talk about investigations, um, which uh, is literally what um, FTC and its predecessor, the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, most of what they did. Uh, in fact, we have this myth that uh, we call these regulatory agencies. Um, but agencies didn't regulate until 1906. What did, what did they do for the first part of their, their livelihood, their life? They investigated. And there's no question that that kind of investigative role is clearly legislative. Um, that's why when Congress used to actually conduct investigations in the 19th century, that's what Congress did. Um, and it's not hard to imagine. I think the, the real debate, the real kind of point of discussion is, um, we see kind of a history of abdication from Congress. So Congress used to investigate. It also, the, Greg made the point that adjudication is somehow not a legislative role. Well, then what was the uh, Court of Claims throughout the 19th century? What was uh, Congress's um, private bill authority uh, where Congress adjud adjudicated at the founding? Clearly adjudication is a legislative power um, and certainly not an executive power. Um, and so I think what we see is that, you know, Congress uh, has has continually abdicated its authority. It used to investigate, it used to adjudicate. Congress then says, oh, that's a lot of work. Let's create the Interstate Commerce Commission. By the way, Interstate Commerce Commission of 1887 created at the same time as the Pacific Railway Commission of 1887. These were clearly legislative commissions. No one would have said that they were executive. But then after Congress decides, well, uh, you know, let's abdicate our investigative authorities. They also decided let's abdicate our rulemaking authorities. Um, so the whole idea, the whole history of the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Pacific Railway Commission was that they conducted inquiries, but then Congress uh, reserved the ability to kind of legislate and rule make. Um, and this is important because uh, it shows that investigations, if we really want to understand what's the law of investigations, we could argue that it's rulemaking. Um, but then after it abdicates its investigative authority, it, it advocates its rulemaking authority. I think what we've now seen is that, um, to, to Greg's point, Starting with around 1975, we started giving um, these agencies not just injunctive authority, but penalty authority. By the way, uh, Greg's wrong. The SEC had injunctive authority um, back uh, in the 30s. Um, so it didn't just get that into 1975. The big change you see in 1975, and it's a change after Nixon, is uh, Congress started just saying, well, we're, we're just going to create an enforcement state. And so I think that's an important um, kind of set of, uh, of, of waypoints for understanding what's really going on. Humphrey's executor was right in the sense that the FTC in 1935 was really just an investigative commission for the purpose of infor informing kind of legislative policy. Uh, the problem now is we've imbued these uh, uh, formerly legislative agencies with penalty authority. And I think that's the death now. The problem, and I think what the really interesting question is, okay, so let's assume that all of these agencies are executive now. Um, what does it mean that congressional oversight can effectively intervene with what these agencies do? Um, you say that they're Article II, um, but uh, should they be immune from congressional oversight? Should uh, that mean that um, we can have, uh, if, if we say that the real fix is just, oh, the president could fire SEC commissioners, does that fix the problem that the SEC can go into court without the Justice Department or the FTC can do that? Does it fix the problem that they have a potential penalty authority that doesn't have to go through uh, kind of Fifth Amendment due process checks? I don't know if it does. And so I think some of this is the implication 
of um, you know what we might mean as a practical matter by saying, well, the president should be able to fire these people. That's my spiel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Next up is Roger Severino. Great. So I'm in a unique position in that these issues are very much personal. I was appointed by President Trump to a three-year term to the Administrative Conference of the United States, which describes itself as an independent agency. And President Biden fired me. Within 27 hours, I sued President Biden. Now, a bit of the background on this. Historically, presidents had free reign to appoint ACUS members, and no subsequent president, regardless of party, would actually ask for their dismissal. Now, why is that? Well, because ACUS is effectively an advisory body with no real executive power, no quasi-legislative power either, no quasi-judicial power. So why did President Biden go after me and a couple other members? You'd have to ask him because he did not actually state any reason whatsoever for asking for my dismissal from this agency. This agency was created by Congress and it provided for a three year statutory term. Now our argument, argued by Christopher Mills, fantastic lawyer, says that based on statutory interpretation, three years must mean something. And we argue it means three years. So we have the three year term. Uh, there's no four cause removal requirement in the actual text of the statute that created my position. And the president provided no reason whatsoever for my dismissal. You combine that plus Humphrey's executor and a Wiener decision at the US Supreme Court, and I win, right? So why me being a good Federalist, why am I bringing this sort of case? Uh, well, I want to make sure that the rules are clear. All parties have been uh, playing by one set of rules that this position was respected. Now that that precedent was broken, the notion that Biden was gonna bring unity was proven false because he went out of his way to go after even advisory committees uh, to get rid of people that were appointed by his predecessor. So what are the rules? Does the president have this actual power to remove people like me or not? Now, as a good Federalist, I have issues with Humphrey's executor. If I were a Supreme Court justice, and ruling on the court case of, is there such a thing as independent agencies with such broad powers, quasi-legislative, et cetera? I would vote no, I would vote no. However, that case has not been reconsidered. Uh, the precedents are still there, and I wanna make sure that those precedents are followed so that it's not just one side gets to benefit from a rule and the other does not. So in one sense, I could win either way. Either I get to be reappointed, that is that is in keeping with the previous standards, uh, or not. And to a degree, Humphrey's executor might be chipped away, uh, which I think is ultimately where, where the Constitution lands on this issue. So interestingly enough, Marbury versus Madison is part of my case as well, which dealt with the presidential commission and the appointment clause power and those constitutional issues Judge Walker asked to be briefed. So there's going to be supplemental briefing on my case on the constitutional questions involved. Interestingly enough, there's a distinction that could be made with Humphrey's executor in that there is no quasi-judicial or legislative power. Um, in Humphrey's executor, the question is, what is the FTC came up? And I don't think they satisfact satisfactorily answered that question. Under what branch of government is the FCC answerable to, right? Is it judicial, article, is it article one, two, or three? You only have three options, right? Yet it created some new thing uh, a new article in the Constitution for these new types of organizations that are, aren't really answerable to any of them directly. In my position, I have a three-year term subject to the appointment by the president. Um, it's not even under advice and consent by the Senate. So what am I? What is my position? That question was raised by the judges because it is somewhat unique uh, what is somebody on an advisory board under a statutory term appointed by the president? Who is that person answerable to? I am dying to find out the ultimate uh, answer to that question because it does touch on these issues of fundamental importance. Is there is all executive power vested in the executive? 
Or is there something else? Is there something new? Is there something outside of it? Again, if I were in a Supreme Court, if I were a, a, a justice, I would vote one way. But hopefully we're going to find out what those rules are and it'll be answered one way or another. And maybe, who knows, um, this question itself will be, my position or question will be answered by the Supreme Court and we'll see exactly how far Humphreys goes. Thanks so much, Roger. And just for the audience, I did a little looking up while Roger was speaking. It's 22-5047 DC Circuit. Oral argument took place on Tuesday, November 1. So Humphrey's executor, very popular uh, in the month of November of 2022. Next up, Kim Whaley to round out our discussions. Thank you so much. Um, so many things to unpack here. I just want to start by saying I completely agree with Greg's point on terms of, you know, the protection of individual liberties really being about the structure of the Constitution, not so much about the uh, what's articulated in the Bill of Rights. And so much of this is being not just litigated in the courts right now, but also, you know, tearing from the headlines, uh, administrative law and federal courts has become sexy in the last five years, who knew? Um, but uh, I, I should say, as a threshold matter as well, um, Greg's point that you know the president does all kinds of other stuff besides just enforcement and executive power um, that raises an, another issue that we're not we're not covering here, but is also I think on the radar of the United States Supreme Court, and that is the non delegation doctrine. You know, all of this discussion really comes down to you know do the vesting clauses are they exclusive or is there you know a checks and balances and shared separation of powers, and of course. Um, even in CELA law, Justice Kagan in, in her dissent made the argument that, listen, separated powers do not mean formal separation. Um, so those are kind of the big picture. I want to just walk through the various stages of how this doctrine developed. Um, my, my view of it, and I've written on this um, several pieces, primarily around the concept of outsourcing of government power, government contracting. I, um, there are several law review articles I've done over the years. Um, because one thing I think that's missing in the discussion of the scope of the power of administrative agencies is how outsourcing, contracting, grant making has increased over the years. And when private parties exercise governmental power pursuant to a contract, there's no Administrative Procedure Act oversight, the Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply, and the Constitution doesn't apply. So if people are concerned, I think, for a good reason about constraining the scope of unaccountable government power, uh, it, it, it's, in my mind, it's important to include government contracting in the overall discussion because for sure, government agencies, however they're fashioned, have less power um, in terms of unaccountable political authority than private contractors that are outside the scope of the Constitution and the regulatory uh, st statutory framework. Um, uh, also can't st help but mention Dobbs, right? Um, Dobbs, I think, has reformulated how we're going to approach constitutional questions to begin with. And the elephant in the room, in my mind, is the fact, as you mentioned, Aram, in the beginning, the removal power is not expressed in the United States Constitution. Appointments in there, but it's implied. So the entire concept of removal is an implied power under Dobbs step one. The question is, should it even be recognized if it's not articulated in the Constitution? And if the answer to that is no, it's not there, then step two would be Dan's argument. That is, we go back to historical precedent and look to see if, um, if it's consistent with history is something that we recognize and that's out this outside the scope of my expertise um of course the first case to recognize the removal power as implied in the constitution was myers versus the united states um, involving the dismissal of the postmaster general in that case really what the, the the court was worried about was congress intruding in in the removal power and the court's been really clear that when it comes to congress aggregating and grabbing some of this appointment and removal power that's a no-no uh that's been pretty well established and that's really i think what meyer myers established is congress can't you know invade the province of the executive branch and then in the context of that articulated that removal power Power was implied. Then we get Humphreys. And I really think in looking at this, you know, Congress has done these things, these new wonky agencies, and the court looks at it and says, are we okay with this? It's almost 
kind of chasing the tail of what Congress has done. And I think SELA law is just another example of that, where essentially the majority said, listen, we don't we just don't like this new designer agency. The same thing with free enterprise fund versus um, PCAOB. We just don't like it. This one is a little too wonky for us without really articulating a clear theory of how to approach this. So in Humphrey's um, that involved a four cause removal, not Congress stepping in and trying to grab power, but constraining this implied removal power. And there the court did come up with this quasi test. OK, well, it's not pure executive power. It's quasi judicial, quasi legislative. We're OK with that. Um, and then that's come to be sort of define this idea of independent agencies. Of course, there's about 66 of them that have this um, multi member uh, board the way the F FTC does, um, where there's limited for cause removal uh, provisions, et cetera. But at the, as a practical matter, any executive agency or not any, but many, even including cabinet level agencies with a single, single secretary exercises quasi power, right? So there's regulatory authority that comes in, the non-delegation doctrine pops in there. Um, there's, in, you know, uh, adjudicative authority. So the quasi test isn't really a test. I think the court just said, all right, we're okay with for cause removal, um, for cause limitations on removal because removal is implied. And by the way, this isn't a purely executive agency. Uh, they do other stuff. So we're less concerned about constraining the, the president's removal power. Um, the big uh, the big problem, I think, with um, um, with the the sort of Walmart challenge is Morrison versus Olson. And I would I would say, I think in looking at the briefs, I, you know, I, I disagree with the court that Greg's brief didn't add something and that Greg actually grapples with Morrison versus Olson, uh, which the motion to dismiss does not. And in Morrison versus Olson, of course, this involved, as Justice Scalia said in his, you know, I think very um, prescient and important dissent. Uh, listen, you're talking purely executive power here. You're talking and a prosecutor who can look at the United States president. I mean, that gets as close to pure Article II power as there is. And the court upheld um, constraints on appointment and removal there and did it in a way that I think actually helps the FTC here. Um, it said that, oh, well, there's limitations on the removal for good cause, almost like the existence of the removal position provisions makes it this the inferior an inferior officer. So it's OK, has constrained duties, doesn't have pure prosecutorial power um, constraints. So does the FTC here says, OK, so it's an inferior officer. I'm not suggesting that the FTC is an inferior officer. That's a whole, you know, the commissioners, that's a whole other concept. But again, I feel like the court kind of justified the the structure here, um, kind of moved away from the quasi test and said, well, um, you know, here it's not core executive power uh, because it, this, this independent council doesn't have, you know, unlimited prosecutorial authority, but made really clear to say, um, the the question of removal and the the propriety of limits on removal is not a purely executive power test, and I really see the challenge to what's happened to the Walmart um, Walmart challenge here is somehow that agencies cannot exercise the argument is agencies can't exercise enforcement authority. Um, pure enforcement authority or ex executive authority with the ability to get penalties with without full removal power. Um, and the courts just never had the hell that or never even come close to that. And as I said, in seal of law, it seems like the, the problem was, OK, too much concentration of power outside appropriations, um, you know, there, there are other sort of details of the CFPB's creation statutorily that the court's like, we're just not comfortable expanding Humphreys. But in terms of a core theory, um, I just don't see, unless the court does what it did in Dobbs and what it looks like it might, it's, well, it's doing with the major question doctrine and other aspects of the constitution, uh, I don't see that with Morrison versus Olson still standing, I don't see a strong argument for challenging the existence of the current structure of the FTC in this moment. Thanks so much, Kim. So uh, there is so much to unpack here. I think I'll be the first to concede that this could have been a full day event uh, or a multi-day event. Uh, but what I will try to do is I'll try to distill um, uh, some of the big points of the discussants and then just give each of you about three minutes to react to each other because there's a fair amount of cross-discussion. 
Uh, so Greg offered the traditionalist uh, formal separation of powers position. Um, and I also want to add, uh, it, it does strike me as odd that the FTC actually opposed amicus uh, briefs. Usually, at least, at least the DOJ usually accedes to that. Um, and then also Dan uh, provided a, a contrary view with regard to a sort of viewed in the Article I valence, in part uh, sort of an instrumental acceptance of some of the advantages of it, Humphreys, uh, given the uh, shift in the authorities of the administrative state. Um, I also and he essentially mentioned that the in 1935, the FTC was just an investigative commission. Uh, so uh, I also wanted to note, uh, I think the quintessence of his view of the power of Congress's investigative authority is that which we each possess, the Freedom of Information Act. You essentially have delegated investigative authority by, by Congress right now during this teleforum. You can exercise it. Uh, Roger, uh, leading a pressing challenge that could set the stage for the broader domain of Humphreys and presidential removal power, depending on how the circuit opines. Uh, and then Kim, um, tying in very nicely with Myers uh, and, and, and also other separation of powers jurisprudence. So no, Myers was authored in 1926 by then Chief Judge Taft, President Taft. Um, so he had a viewpoint uh, on the power of the executive. Um, and keep in mind that Humphreys was the very, very same court that decided Panama refining and ALA Schechter poultry, uh, overturning a section and then the entire National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, which is non-delegation doctrine. So I think it's uh, quite prescient that she's identifying that. Uh, but the next, Greg, three minutes to respond. Yeah, I mean, I mute myself. Uh, let me actually, let me sort of take it in reverse order. And so first, I actually want to specifically thank Kim. Kim is my colleague, as you mentioned, at the University of Baltimore. Kim and I um, had some disagreements, especially over the last years, as to proper scope of both executive authority and judicial authority. And it's always, and I just... I'm personal, I wanted to think because I'm the one who extended an invitation to her to come on this panel. She agreed within 15 minutes. And it's always nice to have perhaps like walking into alliance then. And I really sort of do appreciate both as a colleague at UB, as somebody who may have different views and somebody who appreciates sort of engaging, engaging with those views at a very deep level. Um, so let me just kind of, uh, I think I agree with a lot of what Kim said. I think that there is, um, you know, uh, there are a number of, other sub issues, but uh, let me focus on kind of on one thing that uh, Kim mentioned about this idea that uh, you know court has previously blessed for cause removal, and there's two ways to kind of skin that cat. One is to basically say, look, this simply cannot be because um, you know the president, if he's to carry out you know if he's to carry out his duties, he needs to make sure that his subordinates actually follow his direction. But there's a slightly narrow way to look at it, and that's I'm basically cribbing from uh, former Judge Griffith of the D.C. Circuit, who said, look, cause, we can leave the four cause removal, but cause must include this kind of refusal to follow president's direction, refusal to take the nations in the direction the president wants to. So I think either way you do it, I think ultimately the presidential authority runs paramount. I think my biggest, not even disagreement, I think ultimately we come up to a very similar point is with Daniel, so I just wanted to respond a couple of things. Um, look, I agree that investigation uh, done right, and even in some sense adjudication, maybe within congressional authority. Congress investigates all the time. Con in fact, I would want Congress to investigate before they start passing legislation. I want them to know what they're doing and not just randomly throwing you know darts at a, at a page and hoping something good comes out of it. Uh, but I think uh, once you... Uh, so if FTC was just doing reports, much like CRS, much like perhaps even administrative conference of the United States, that will be one thing. But FTC and SEC are doing other things. Um, furthermore, leaving aside the non-delegation doctrine, which I think is due to be revitalized, I think as a general conceptual matter, it is less somewhat, not much, but somewhat less problematic when I delegate my own power as, well, as opposed to when I de delegate your power. Right. It's one thing to say, look, uh, we're congressmen, we're too busy. We can't do we can't do all the investigation in our hearings when about 40 million members on the days and everybody has only five minutes to speak uh, and needs to get on Twitter. Right. As opposed to uh, let's delegate to somebody else. 
It's quite a different story to say that we're going to take presidential power in a different branch and disperse that. So I think to the extent these agents are doing something beyond mere investigation, uh, you know, I think uh, that, that raises additional concerns above and beyond the, the non-delegating power, non-delegating doctrine. Thanks so much, Greg. Dan? Thank you. So um, I kind of want to make two, again, historical points, because I think we're all scratching on the surface, but like, I think we actually all agree that there's some type of uh, power that is clearly executive and some type of power that is clearly legislative. And I think we just have to talk about the practical implications of that. So I think some interesting points. One is we talk about Myers, we talk about Humphrey's executor. Who knows what court those two cases originated in? It was not Article Three; it was a court of federal claims, right? So Kim, this is actually perfectly relevant to your whole discussion of government contractors, which have existed since the founding and who were given all sorts of powers, right? Private bill powers um, without executive, without presidential oversight. Um, so I think that's interesting, right? Because just take Roger's case. Roger did not file his case in the Court of Federal Claims, right? But both Humphreys and Myers came out of the Court of Federal Claims. And that's telling. That's telling because the presumption was that these are Article I agencies. The presumption now is that, you know, the all of these commissions are Article II agencies. There's only one reason why we have that presumption. And that is because the passage of the Administrative Procedure Act effectively puts uh, rulemaking and enforcement powers within a single agency. Um, so I think that's something to consider. The second thing is that um, I think we have to deal with the fact that, you know, Greg, you make this point, well, if it was just investigations, that would be legislative. But once you go beyond that, like, I don't know, subpoena power, injunctive power, all of that, it becomes executive. Well, under that theory, GAO is executive because GAO has the ability to issue not just uh, requests for information to the executive branch, um, not just requests for information to government contractors, um, not just adjudicative powers in the bid protest process, but GAO now actually has signed by President Trump. It was the first executive action signed by President Trump was to give GAO independent authority to enforce its subpoenas in court. Is that executive? Um, certainly can't, as a matter of history, if you're an originalist, your argument is that's not you can't say that's an executive power because throughout the founding, the idea of enforcing subpoenas was clearly something that was legislative, particularly over corporations, particularly over corporations. Um, so food for thought, those are my only points. Um, CRS, by the way, also has investigative authority over the executive, um, has used it. Is it executive? I don't know. The librarian of Congress to whom CRS reports is appointed by the president. Does the president have the authority to fire the librarian of Congress? Does the president have the authority to fire the Comptroller General, who was, again, uh, presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed? I think those are the questions that I think, if we can answer them, we can actually develop a clear, bright line principles to resolve these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Next up is Roger. Dan, you raised some excellent points. I was thinking that GAO is the model of Congress asserting its authority to create something like an agency that assists Congress. Right. So as when I was a regulator, I would get requests from GAO and we complied uh, because we knew if we didn't, we would get Congress mad at us. Right. And Congress has the power of the purse. And that's that's the ultimate check. So you can have an agency that has all this power that has somebody appointed by the president like GAO, um, but do it in a constitutional manner. Right. So there you really see that Congressional Research Services, those are much more arms of Congress. And them having subpoena power, I don't think changes that too much. If you're in civil litigation, private individuals have subpoena power, right? They could request documents, et cetera. And so that doesn't, that doesn't trouble me that much. But what gets into trouble is with Humphreys when it said very specifically, adopting the Wilsonian view of rule by experts, right? It was dripping with this notion that if we get politics out of it and leave it to the experts, we're all gonna be better off. And it's specifically said that if you have a length of terms and you get that independence that in, they're insulated, they will build that expertise and that's good for the country, right? It was a suspicion of political power and control from anybody, from Congress or the president. They wanted it to be an absolutely independent agency. They said that spe specifically, as independent as possible, and they created this notion of quasi-judicial, quasi-legislative to get around the constitutional structures. 
Um, and this is, I think, the most troubling sentence from, from Humphreys. When it's talking about the nature of the duties of the FTC, it says, quote, it is charged with the enforcement of no policy except the policy of the law, end quote. What is that? Right. That That is you have this this non-accountable entity with the power of the policy of the law that that seems like it combines executive, judicial and um, legislative all in one. What is the policy of the law? And I think that is quite dangerous when we don't have accountability from the people, most clearly from the executive. Thanks, Roger. And to close it out, Kim, uh, anyone who is a, an attendee, please feel welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, and if we have time, we will get to them. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to add, except that, you know, from the broader separation of powers perspective, there are two other actors that are part of this discussion, and that is the United States Congress and the Supreme Court. So, you know, if, if the re removal power is unlimited, I, I don't know what the limiting principle of unlimitedness that is. So we then would have a situation, implied removal power, where the president could remove at will pretty much everyone within the executive branch that's exercising quasi-executive power. And we're in a um, in a time frame where you know we're seeing presidential abuses of power come um, come to the forefront in ways that are, are that are um, you know historically unprecedented. And the you know the other two branches are in place. The, the United States Congress creates these, these designer agencies, and we're seeing in other areas dealing with major questions, doctrine, voting rights, act, et cetera, um, congressional authority constraint. And then the third actor in the room, of course, is the, is the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, where I am on this, I, in, in the question of the separation of powers, is transferring too much power to unelected justices to construe ambiguities based on policy outcomes makes me uncomfortable. And um, given that we are talking about a legislative pronouncement about how to manage um, unlimited executive power, uh, I'm more comfortable with deference to the United States Congress than to the to the to unelected justices and or an unlimited executive. And that's I think what is potentially on the table if something like Humphreys were rewound. Now I want to add, I agree with Roger in that the or the implication of what Roger said, um, the research definitely doesn't show that independent agencies somehow are more independent or apolitical or less exact, less expert or more expert, all of that. Um, I'm not sure the experiment, the notion behind having independence from the presidency has produced better policy outcomes than executive branch agencies that have a cabinet level official at the top. Um, but again, to me, that's a policy judgment for Congress. And given from an originalist textualist standpoint, the ambiguity in the Constitution around these constraints, um, I, I don't like the idea of red lines being drawn by the court in a way that would upend uh, decades, if not a century, of administrative uh, jurisprudence. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. One question coming in from a member of the audience uh, that I personally don't have the acumen to answer. Uh, if there are infirmities in the ability of the FTC to enforce rules, such as the telemarketing sales rule, the TSR, are those concerns mooted? if any enforcement action is brought by the Department of Justice. Any takers uh, among the panellists? I'll, I'll take a shot on it. I think, it, I mean, I think it, again, depends what else FTC is doing, but sure. I mean, again, if, um, in that sense, you can think about lots of people can come to DOJ with complaints saying so-and-so is doing something bad or you're not, and ultimately DOJ decides and exercises executive discretion and uh, how the resources are getting spent, whether or not to bring the complaint. Mm -hmm. If the president doesn't like it, they can fire people. So I think that would be at least a step in the right direction. I can also weigh in on that. I, I actually worked at the FTC early in my career. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I know from the, and the antitrust arm, I was in the consumer protection arm, um, you know, in my recollection, and, you know, I, it might, might not be entirely accurate in terms of how they carve up the work, but there was some jockeying for cases that between the DOJ and the FTC, that is, um, in theory, the DOJ could, could enforce 
the same or much of the same law that the FTC has the authority to do. So in setting aside removal as a pragmatic matter, if we want enforcement of federal law by executive branch officials, I'm not so sure as a policy matter, it has to be vested in the FTC. I'm also not so sure as a legal matter that the 1970 amendments were unconstitutional. Um, but if the question is pragmatic, my experience, I don't know that there's a, a really um, important dividing line between DOJ and FTC lawyers in that regard. Thanks so much. Uh, I think our, our last question for the day is a theoretical one. Uh, essentially, what is the legitimacy of the modern FTC? Should it even exist? Um, gets a little bit far afield from the constitutional question that we have, but I'm happy to ask it. Uh, and if anyone wants to respond, they're welcome to do so. Well, looking from the opinion you know, of Humphreys itself, it says it's about regulating corporations, except banks, uh, from using unfair methods of competition in commerce. That is extremely broad. And to have that sort of broad mandate would suggest you need to have a politically accountable head able to have power to remove and appoint. Yeah, let me just, I would just jump on. Uh, and this is why I made the historical argument about, you know, we, we if, you, if you talk to um, someone at the FTC or the SEC, or you talk to someone at the civil fraud division of DOJ, they'll say they're prosecutors. And what they're prosecutors of, and really what they say is they're market enforcers. And I think this is this is actually dangerous because, um, and, and the best way of articulating this is um, Justice Murphy's dissent in Oklahoma Press Publishing versus Walling, um, which articulates actually, if, if you're concerned about liberty, the worst thing you want is the idea of the president as market enforcer. And part of the reason for that is because if you're truly an originalist and you're about the use gentium and the use, uh, you know, whatever you want to say about, you know, law of the soil and all this stuff, if you're truly someone who's a constitutional conservative, um, you don't want the president regulating corporations because corporations are creatures of the state, are creatures of municipality. That's a big separation of powers issue. Um, that's why it has always been um, subject to the legislative fear, uh, uh, sphere. And I think, you know, what, what, what we haven't really said is like, let's just be honest, Congress isn't equipped anymore to regulate corporations. Congress has abdicated that, that authority. And that's really the starting problem with all of this. And I think, you know, we're, we're at this point now where it's like, yeah, the solution is not legislative. So let's just look to the courts to fix the problem. And I think it, it's just... It's an underlying problem that that is in search of a solution. Well, let me like use those last 15 seconds, Aaron, if I could very briefly respond. I agree with Daniel that you know we should not have the president pick market winners and losers regular corporations. However, I think it's even worse when somebody who's not at all politically responsible, who is there for an interim period of time, is doing that. It's bad when the president does it, but it's even worse when it's unaccountable administrative agency does it. <laughs> well. Thank you so much. We were able to fit it all in within one hour. Uh, thanks again to the Federalist Society for hosting this teleforum. It should be available and posted online in a couple of days. Absolutely. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of, our, of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, please keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>